My name is Craig Mitchell, and this is my faith story. I'm going to start my story by sharing a conversation I had with my soon-to-be brother-in-law when I was in college, and at the time, he was studying to be a pastor at Fuller Seminary. And at the time, I was really struggling with my faith, and so he gave me this visual of me literally sitting on a fence. And he said, you know, Craig, you can spend your whole life on that fence never making a decision to pick a side, well, wouldn't life be so much more meaningful if you did? And like any college kid, I let those words of wisdom go into one ear, fly out the other, uh, not, to remem- not to be remembered until years later. So let's rewind back. Let's go to my childhood. Uh, Christianity at that time in my life came pretty easy to me. There were the good guys, there were the bad guys. The bad guys always had their comeuppance. There were a clear set of rules, and you never questioned them. Seriously. You would never in a million years catch me jumping over a fence that had a no trespassing sign. And if the salad bar says one trip only, you better believe I am only taking one trip. You know, Christianity provided a wonderful structure for me as a young child. Uh, I grew up in a Christian community. I went to church. Uh, I went to church camp, mission trips, Christian elementary school. you might even say that all my friends were, quish, were Christian, uh, and you could go as far as saying that maybe I was a bit uh, sheltered. And the best part is I didn't have to ask any hard questions, just me and Jesus doing our thing. And in the mind of a child, Jesus can be a lot of things. He can be the ultimate father that tells you everything's going to be okay, or he can be a magic genie that you can pray to to get a Sega Genesis, which I might have done. Of course, in college, I went through my obligatory question everything phase. I learned a lot in philosophy 101, and I even grew out my hair, which in my case, kind of make me look like a hobbit. Away from my Christian upbringing, it was easy to let Jesus hang out in the background, not necessarily disavowing him, but it was my first introduction to the agnostic viewpoint, which let me tell you, was pretty attractive. You're telling me I don't have to decide if there's a God or not? I don't have to take a leap of faith. I can just put aside all these important questions about purpose and life and death and just say, we'll see what happens. Whew, what a load off my mind. I then met my soon-to-be wife, Elizabeth, and there was something very different about her. She wasn't sheltered. She felt authentic and grounded, like someone who had wisdom beyond her years. And while I didn't totally understand it at the time, I admired it. I admired her conviction that her faith couldn't be rocked by an afternoon in philosophy class. And through our relationship and her strong faith, I found my philosophical college years behind me. And I was back to the straight and narrow path of my church-going ways. And for many years, being a Christian came easy. In fact, I sort of saw myself as having this preordained destiny, that God had chosen me to do special things in this world. I actually attribute this belief for much of my early success in my life and in my career. My childlike view of the world protected me from its harsh realities. It's pretty easy to ignore all the philosophical questions when life is going pretty well. But the truth is, up until that point, my faith had never really been tested. But starting in 2015, two events changed all that. And all those questions I buried in my mind, those would come to the forefront. Anyone who knows our family, or heard my wife's faith story two years ago, is very familiar with this first event. In 2015, my wife and I experienced a difficult time bringing our two boys, Harrison and RJ, into the world. Starting at around 12 weeks, we knew the pregnancy was gonna be a difficult one. And twin pregnancies often are, but this one was really a step above. Every day we'd wake up, uncertain if our boys were gonna make it, especially RJ. We were going in three to four times a week to get scanned, seeing the top prenatal specialists in the country. And it was an emotionally trying time. And I felt particularly helpless and a bit useless in the situation. I mean, I would do my own research on the subject, but being married to a lawyer, I really couldn't hold a candle to her research skills. I would show up with an interesting article, and she would counter it with some 40-page symposium by the foremost expert in India. 
So having no control over the situation, feeling totally helpless, there's never been a time in my life where I prayed more. And against all the odds from every doctor we saw, our boys were born at 31 weeks. Harrison weighing three and a half pounds, RJ weighing 1.3. And both were sent to the neonatal intensive care unit, or the NICU, where Harrison spent six weeks and RJ spent four months. I also spent a lot of time in that NICU, bouncing between our home in North Hollywood, our, my job in Burbank, and the hospital in Beverly Hills. You know, I actually read the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy and The Hobbit out loud to my kids during their stay, which made me very popular with the nurses. And I'm also aware I've now made two Hobbit references in my faith story, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> but RJ was released from the NICU on January 1st, 2016, and we finally had both kids home after a very trying ordeal. And we've had some difficult challenges since then, but both kids are healthy and happy. Turning to God in our time of need provided peace and comfort. It's funny how when you feel things are totally out of your control, it's so much easier to turn to God and just put it all into his hands. It's the other times when it's harder. And for me, that came in the aftermath. Over four months, we saw a lot of babies go in and out of that NICU. Some stayed for days, weeks, maybe just overnight. And you'd see the same grief and anxiety washing over the faces of those countless parents, concerned for the lives of their children. Most of the time, it was just a minor issue, the doctor playing it safe after a difficult delivery. But occasionally, I'd see that one baby come in. And looking at the reactions from the doctors, the whispered conversations, it became very clear that they weren't going to make it. And I found myself struggling with this notion like prior times in my life, I prayed to God and he delivered part of my preordained destiny, right? But I started thinking about those other parents. Did they not pray hard enough? Were they not Christian enough? Was my ego so misguided and massive that I had the arrogance to believe that God chose to save my children, but not the others because my faith was stronger? I mean, God is handing us as close to a full-blown miracle as possible. I should be on my hands and knees praising him and yet all I can do is think that none of this is really adding up. So I spent the next couple of years doing some soul searching. Even though our lives were pretty chaotic, I took a job in Marina del Rey, which equates to about four hours of driving every single day. And there's no better place to find the meaning of life than at the interchange of the 101 and 405, going all of two miles per hour in morning traffic. And it was there that I spent hours listening to top philosophers and thinkers of our time, Christians, Buddhists, atheists, agnostics. I kept telling myself that somewhere buried in one of these podcasts or YouTube videos or books on tape was a clear and definitive answer to our existence. I started getting coffee with Pastor Mike on a regular basis to share whatever new and deeply insightful idea I had heard during that week. And while Pastor Mike didn't have the specific answer I was looking for, I was comforted knowing that even too, he had his questions around faith that maybe there was, in fact, no definitive answer. And so there I was, once again, sitting on the fence. <laughs> Which leads me to my second event. In 2017, my father died, about two years after our NICU experience. My dad was a good and loving man. I have so many great memories of him growing up as a child, coaching my soccer teams, being the Cub Scout master, driving all over Southern California to find me that very specific Star Wars action figure I was looking for. Whether it was dropping off bread to random people in the community, donating to animal charities, or taking us to soup kitchens to pro provide for those less fortunate, he spent years in service to others. But underneath all that was a man who was suffering deeply, something I didn't recognize at a young age. My father was an alcoholic, not violent, or abusive, but sad and lonely. I can recall countless times finding him passed out on the couch when I came home from school. I have memories of hearing him late at night rummaging through the garbage on the side of the house, a common spot where he hid his alcohol that just happened to be right next to my bedroom window growing up. I remember living in the college dorms and on multiple occasions, my dad would call me to tell me he has a gun and he wants to end it all relying on his 18-year-old son to talk him off the ledge. And I had always hoped that he would find peace or purpose, but sadly, it never happened. After I graduated high school, my parents divorced, and he moved in with his mother. 
And there he spent nearly 20 years in his loneliness and in his pain, never having the strength or will to change it. <clears throat> in 2016, he was diagnosed with cirrhosis of the liver, a result of decades of drinking. In over nine months, I watched my father go from 220 pounds to a meager 130. I watched his mind evolve into hazy confusion, at times unable to recognize his own son sitting, sitting in the same room. I occasionally saw a glimmer of the father I knew, holding out hope that he may recover and miraculously become the grandfather to my children that I knew he could be. The soccer coach, the Star Wars action figure hunter, the Den Pack leader. But those things never happened. Two months before the birth of our third child, my father died unceremoniously in the back room of my grandma's house. And in the aftermath, in the aftermath I was gutted. I wasn't angry. I just felt hollow. There was something about how my father died that stuck with me. The deterioration of his flesh and body felt very real and physical, devoid of spirituality. I couldn't make sense of it. I mean, I know God doesn't promise an easy life and that being Christian doesn't shield you from pain. But this, 30 years of pain and suffering, decades of drinking and depression, and it just ends. No purpose to it, no meaning. It was just a dead body. I could no longer see life instilled with divine purpose, part of some larger plan, but instead, I started to believe that we live in a world of chaos and randomness, desperate to make sense of it and falsely assigning spiritual meaning where there is none, a world that bears no evidence for miracles, only old stories that require huge leaps of faith, where the most likely answer is that we are just atoms floating through space. Now, that might sound terrifying to some of you, but for me, it was a refreshing thought. All that matters is the here and now. You live, you die, you make the best of the time you have. I became very focused on this notion, really focusing in on the scientific method, one that requires a highly disciplined process that takes nothing as fact until proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. And I felt enlightened. Like I had reached the natural, natural end point of my journey, starting with all those questions I had years ago. I even started to see faith as a weakness, embraced by people who couldn't see the reality of this world. I recognized the need for people to believe in something more, to give them hope, but not me. I was stronger than that. I didn't need God. Now, Pastor Garrett has talked a lot about epiphanies in the past few weeks, and this is about the time when I had mine. You see, I tried to live my life without God. I really did. And there were certainly challenges, like being married to an amazing Christian woman who I felt like I was just disappointing on a regular basis. But I couldn't just pretend to be a Christian to placate her or anyone else. But what I came to realize is this enlightenment I experienced, it's a trap. It's alluring to think that you can create a life without God, to free yourself from that dependence in pursuit of something noble. You know, as a child, non-believers were sort of presented to me as being selfish, right? They focused on worldly possessions, money, greed, power. They were never presented as being noble in their aim, like the pursuit of knowledge or the person fighting to solve injustice, so for many, year, for many years, I, I kind of confused the two notions a bit. And I started to believe that you can live a life with pure and honest intentions, but without God. I mean, Christians don't have an exclusive on good deeds. And as long as I avoided concepts like greed and power and selfishness, that was enough. God doesn't need to be a part of the equation. But I was wrong. Because what I've come to understand is that worldly enlightenment, it's important, but it's not enough and you actually become a slave to it, a slave to your accomplishments, a slave to your vices, or like my dad, a slave to your pain. And that's what I believe ultimately happened to him. Even though he tried to live a life with a true servant's heart, to give himself, his time, his money, his, his everything to others, it was never enough because he made a choice. A choice not to see a world of hope, but to see a world laid bare, full of tragedy, unfairness, evil deeds, also mixed in with his own perceived failures. 
And that choice allowed hopelessness to creep into his world and eat away at him until nothing was left. And here's the thing. For most of my adult life, I've had this fear that I would eventually become like my dad. That life would get too hard or I would come to some realization and be unable to cope with life's many struggles. And so I modeled a lot of my life around not falling into the same pitfalls, thinking if I could avoid some event that sent them down the wrong path, I would be okay. Like all those podcasts, I was trying to find the definitive answer for how my dad turned out the way he did, sort of like a puzzle or an equation that I needed to solve. And that's what led me to my epiphany. My epiphany is you a choice in this world and a choice that must be made without all the evidence, without the definitive proof. And you can choose to live a life on the fence, never really making a decision. I've lived that life for way too long, and I can tell you there's no satisfaction in it. It's like living in a state of arrested development, like a child who never grew up. You can also choose to live life without God, which, by the way, is also a leap of faith. And I know what that looked like for me, and it's ultimately empty and meaningless. Or you can choose to trust God. Trust that he has a plan, even if we don't understand it. And trust that your decision in him will bear fruit in this world. Fruit that spreads his love, his joy, his peace. You see, I had to make the decision to live life on the other side of the fence to understand what was missing in my life. And let me, let me be clear. I don't see choosing God as making all the tough questions go away. I mean, Israel literally means struggle with God. And I also don't see choosing God as abandoning logic, abandoning the pursuit of science or knowledge. It only means that you're approaching those things with a set of beliefs built from your own experience and the experience of everyone that has come before you. So my story, I don't see it as a story of losing my faith and finding it again. I see it as an evolution where I needed to live my life with certain experiences before I could have a real and tested faith. And I'm thankful to God for providing me with life's challenges, for the opportunity to grow stronger. And now I feel blessed to have a family of my own, to have the responsibility to teach my children and raise them with a strong foundation of faith and to understand the wisdom and the love that God brings into our lives. Before I close, I want to talk about one more thing. I've always struggled with the concept of evangelism. I've always seen life as live and let live. I shouldn't force my beliefs onto others. I mean, if you look at my Facebook page, I probably post once a year, and it's usually a picture of my kids. And I've come to understand the reason for this has a lot to do with growing up in the home of an alcoholic. A common theme I've discovered is that when there's an alcoholic in the family, there's a lot of covering for that person. The family creates this image of the perfect life and everyone must commit to the lie. And it was in this period of my life that I started to develop these habits of holding back my true feelings, of putting a smile on my face, of not expressing unpopular opinions. And funny enough, this approach to life has had its advantages. It's much easier to climb the corporate ladder with a can-do attitude, right? But if my journey has taught me anything, it's that I want to share it with others, and not just those that share the same beliefs. You look at society right now, especially my generation, and there has been a mass exodus from the church. And I think there's a lot of reasons for this. There's the increase in technology that has opened people's worlds to more viewpoints, but it's also created all those distractions, each day filled with stories or events that get us angry or divided. And don't get me wrong, this proliferation of technology has brought a lot of good. I'm not suggesting we smash all the machines or go on the search for John Connor, but it has also uprooted many of our institutions and societal norms while suicide rates, drug overdoses, depression are at record highs. The church has also seen its fair share of controversies the past 20 years, and some people don't like the association. There are many in my generation who feel we've ignored the world's inequalities or global threats. They associate Christianity with an ideology that chooses to ignore the problems of earth, focusing on what's coming in the afterlife. And why am I saying all this? 
I'm saying it because I feel a call in my life to be bolder in my faith, to stop being afraid of the word evangelism, evangelism and push back against this false narrative around the church. My generation, like every generation before it, is facing new challenges, and it falls on people of strong conviction to not hide their faith, to not be afraid of ridicule and rejection in a culture that is clearly going through a tough transition right now. And let's be honest, it's not as easy today as it was 30 years ago to proudly proclaim your faith. But we need faith more than ever. And having gone through my journey and having seen the other side of the fence, I pray that I can be a greater witness, to be a shining example of God's light and to remind people there is more to life than endless consumption. I want to support our great spiritual leaders like Pastor Garrett, who in a short time has inspired me to be more bold in my faith. I want to be more fearless in sharing the joy, community, and love that God offers all of us. And that means stepping out of my bubble. It means joining others in my generation and having the boldness to share our faith. It means relying on the older generation to not fade into the background, but to rely on your wisdom and your experience. And it means all of us raising a new generation who believes, loves, and fears God, who can be ready to lead when the time is right. I want us as a community to be the fruit, to prove through our lives, our beliefs, our actions, that trust in God is not a weakness, It's a purpose to be the fruit that springs forth when you place your trust and you make the choice to place your trust in God. Thank you for letting me share my faith story. See you.